Sounds fantastic. Sounds good to me. Um, so we will get started. Do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you've done to get started? And then we'll have students ask questions. And if yeah. you want, I can have a student come up here so you can actually see their face as they ask the question as well. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You could do that. Why not? That it makes it probably more, more beautiful. And just a question: What, what is a student officer? What does officer mean, Willow? So um, there's a bunch of different titles. I'm the senator for the SAFS club, but there's also um, president, vice president, oh. stuff like that. So it's just a group of students that run for a position for the club. So I'm one of those. I see. Okay, and, and final question before I tell you who I am. Um, what 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 uh, what universities? I heard you have a you have a bachelor's and a master's program, probably a PhD program, and yes. uh, you're in the middle of nowhere. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort so of. Where, where where so where is the university? Just describe it for somebody who has never been to the United States. Okay, oh. so we are in Oklahoma. It's like middle of Oklahoma and Edmond. If you know where Texas is, <laughs> we're right above Texas. Yeah. We're the state right mm -hmm. above Texas. Yeah. Very, that helps all. That's, a not, that's a good description. Yeah. Everybody okay. knows where Texas is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most people know where Texas is. Um, so, okay. I'm a forensic biologist. I, I started with my first, you know, when I first stumbled into it, that was 30 years ago. And um, I tried to learn genetic fingerprints. This is how it started because they were invented 1984 by Alec Jeffreys in England. And uh, I was just interested. And the only institute that we could do it at that point was the Institute for Legal Medicine or Forensic Medicine, which was a university institute in um, Germany. And since the biologists were considered to be like, I don't know, fourth class beings, you know, first came the medical doctors and then medical doctors and then medical doctors. And then afterwards came the biologists. So they just put us in the basement where the corpses were literally not kidding. So this is how I stumped. <laughs> So so this is how it all started. I just wanted to learn genetic fingerprints, but then I was surrounded by corpses and cases and police people. And that's the story. And now I'm now I'm mostly doing cases, complicated cases. Um, we are a little bit like Sherlock Holmes. This is probably why it <laughs> looks like that here. This is this is not this is not a computer background. This is this is like actual real background. And um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we 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 get uh, like the little team. We we get the cases that nobody else wants to do. That's it. Um, does anybody have, anybody have a question? That? I have a question. Can you talk about, um, you worked on some high profile cases. Can you talk about one or two of those in your experiences and what you kind of contributed to those cases? I mean, for you, probably the most high profile case would be uh, Adolf Hitler's uh, skull and teeth. I imagine, I don't know, but that would probably. Uh, yes, yes. And um, that was interesting because probably it's interesting for the for you being most of you being students, um, I, it was a TV request from National Geographic, and they were um, then back then they were filming in very very high quality all over the world and producing programs for planet Earth or in the contract it says for the whole universe. So obviously they are broadcasting in the whole universe, and. Um, I just said yes, because I thought, okay, why not? I mean, how difficult can it be? And then um, I flew over to Moscow. And first, they were doing another piece about the corpse of Lenin, who was uh, the leader of the Soviet Union before uh, Stalin. And I was like, oh, nice, another corpse, <laughs> before we even start to look at, at Adolf Hitler. And so I made contact to the son of the first person who embalmed um lenin embalming is not the same thing all around the world so in the united states embalming is mostly injecting formalin but in other parts of the world it's done differently so i learned a lot about that and also about the political implications and then we went to um, adolf hitler and that was also interesting because the um teeth were at the secret service uh, main central office building literally in the in i mean it was the main FSB building and the skull was stored in a state archive. So I was asking myself, 
why are they not like put together and why are they not taken care of in a high profile manner? Because nobody took it very seriously. You know, they would just put the boxes there and they're like, oh yeah, okay, you know, do just observe whatever you want to observe until one of the secret service agents came over from uh, the from the Russians. And uh, we had an X-ray from um, the British secret service and also from another secret service, I forget, it's it's too long ago. And then the, the Russian guy came over and said, hey, uh, let's talk, you know, amongst people who are directly related to the case, not the TV people. So I got um, some interesting requests from their side because they were also not too sure about a 100% safe identification of the, the teeth that were at the Secret Service compared to the X-rays that were not at the Secret Service. They, they came from the, um, from the British Secret Service. And also later... I got the origin, original X-rays uh, from another source, from a private source, who he he auctioned the original X-rays, and thought it was it would be interesting for me to compare the X-rays of live Adolf Hitler to the teeth of dead Adolf Hitler because that gives you a pretty safe match if these are really the teeth um, of him. And what what I why I'm why I'm mentioning that is. On the one side, you're in very hot water. I mean, you know, like dealing with all types of secret services, that's like, oh, come on. I mean, probably everybody's lying and I don't know, it's about politics and whatnot. But at the same time, you have that was a unique um, slot in time and space in which I could do the investigations. And at the end, in the, at the end of the day, I was the only one who to do everything. I mean, some people did something like, you know, one person took a drawing of the teeth. Then we had the reports from the Soviets who were in Berlin when um, Hitler's corpse was found. You know, there were lots of bits and pieces. But since the TV was there, I could talk to the translator of, um, of uh, Stalin and also to a secret service person who was the first to write a book about the case. Um, and the KGB had allowed the book to be published, meaning that you you know, you have to double and triple check all the information. in. But over the years, the case became interesting. In the beginning, I thought it was just a boring uh, case because, you know, like comparing teeth to an X-ray. I mean, you, you could ask some forensic odontologists to help you and then case close. But all the other little move, you know, when did which army move where and which photo is like afterwards was changed compared to the photo that we got before, who had heard about the case. For example, I was friends with the head of the Institute of Legal Medicine in Eastern Berlin during the communist Eastern Berlin time. I wrote his biography and uh, later when he was when he died. And so I would just encourage you enter the hot water or even enter a boring case, or just don't be afraid. I mean, you can contribute whatever comes out. <laughs> and if nothing comes out, then nothing comes out. But if something comes out, it could be pretty interesting. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. What a very cool experience for you. And the fact that you got to be involved in like every step of the process. Does anyone else have any questions? What does your knuckle say? <laughs> what is it? What? <laughs> yes. The tattoos hold fast. That's, that's, oh, that's, cool. that's, and that's very true. That's very true for uh, cases. Um, by the way, that was the first question that I was asked when I got the like the, the quick entry to the United States uh, last year. <laughs> <laughs> Customs officer was the first. Well, what are your tattoos about? And, um, <laughs> but the good, the good thing was, I think she liked me because I have a glittering a Batman, um, oh, you know, no. for glitters. I don't know if you can see that. And then I, th <laughs> and then I, I took I took my personal identif identification card. I didn't think of it. And then she was looking at the at the you know the little thing there, the Batman thing. And I think then the tattoos were not that relevant. But seriously, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is something. This is something that I can really recommend. Hold fast you know hold on tight to your cases because many cases like religious cases with bleeding you know like statues or or sexual assault cases where nobody believes a word we we just had a case this is published you can you can look it up at the american academy of forensic sciences meeting like two or three years ago i published it the case came in nobody believed the girl because 
she said, I was raped for like one hour anally by a friend um, that I know and I took him home, but only because he was drunk and he wanted to sleep. But the thing was, everybody knew that he he had been there before and um, he he tried to, you know, like do sexual things and she rejected that. So everybody said, come on, this is at your home in the room that you have in in the apartment building with your parents with your grandparents i mean how can a rape take place there because you could just open the door and then your parents and grandparents would come in and she said well i didn't want to disturb my parents and grandparents and probably she was also like also drunk and also and shy and i don't know and then we just we we and no the police didn't even collect evidence because they were like, come on, you know, you were dancing before, you were at a party before, everybody saw you, you took him home. And, you know, it's just, it just didn't happen. And then I did hold fast. I did hold on tight to the case. And I asked her, like, after after quite a while, I asked, like, say, by, do you by any chance kept the clothing and the bed sheets from that day? And she's like, yeah, I didn't wash them. I kept them. And I'm like, oh, my God, the police didn't take them. And so we could look at the locations of the sper sperm stains. And that was interesting because, I mean, the guy said, yeah, I ejaculated, you know, like consensually, no problem. But the stories didn't match between her um, and him concerning the location of the sperm stains. So that that's that's one of these hold fast cases and of course nobody has money in in many of my cases so um that's also a thing you have to decide if you want to especially for you in the united states um because i, I get a lot of questions about that um how much money could you charge and how could you have a career and so on and so on we don't have that in my lab we, nobody has a career we work on the lowest possible level with with the you know the most stable materials by microscope is 25 years old and it still oh, works wow. so you know we we don't get money or fame we we just get cases and get the cases done no matter if people have money or not so do you work in a like a private lab is it your lab or do you work for a government agency and uh in you're in germany correct still do um, they have government agency labs there so how does that work yeah there is a, a lot of things are changing. So I started in Germany in the in the basement, you know, at the Institute for Legal Medicine mm -hmm. that I mentioned before with the corpses. Um, mm -hmm. Then directly after my PhD, I, I didn't even go to my PhD party. I couldn't because I was in the airplane to the United States. And then I worked at the Institute of Legal Medicine, which is called Office of Chief Medical Examiner in, uh, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards... Um, I went to Germany and worked at the Institute of Zoology, where I did some genetic fingerprinting of okay. animals and um, worked at Body Worlds, the, the exhibit with uh, where the corpses are plastinated. So you can show real yes. corpses anatomy uh, wise. We are still in very good connection with them. I do my student trainings uh, every summer um, at, at their big um institute where they have like hundreds of uh, corpses that's very good for trainings uh last time uh, the last two years we got a nice suicide an electrocution suicide like an actual corpse so we could work on that uh, with the students that was good and um very soon after i came back to germany i talked to the police they were like yeah we'll get you we'll give you a job right away but it's forbidden because you have a phd and then you would get more money than the head of our homicide department and uh, we cannot do that we cannot give oh. like like for for legal reasons it's forbidden for legal reasons nobody can earn more money than the head of the the i mean the police guy that um, is really interesting and so different but very interesting come on in tim hello tim <laughs> and hello, tim. Uh, tim is another professor here and he actually teaches our medical legal death scene investigation course and he used to be a death scene investigator he's getting on camera right now to sweet, say hi sweet sweet i like that <laughs> i like that a lot and um so i couldn't work for the police for legal reasons 
um, money reasons, so to speak. And uh, then I said, okay, it's not a problem. You know, we can we can just cooperate in the cases, and you can charge, uh, or I can charge you something. And especially for the forensic um, entomology cases, that was very interesting at that point. That was around like 2001, 2002. And everybody was like totally hyped with forensic entomology. So we did a lot of cooperations with the police there um, with nearly no money. Uh, but I didn't care. And we established a good relationship when it came to serial uh, killings and so on and so on, because everybody trusted everybody. So that's, again, something that I could um, recommend to you. Just get a good basis of trust to your local, whoever it is, like, you know, from the press to the police, to the courts, to everybody. So they know that you know what you're doing. You work properly. You work transparently. You work objectively. Um, you you give all your sources and you talk to everybody. And so um, it was easy for me. And then I became, it's called officially approved and certified. It's not like the certification boards in the United States. It's a different thing. And that's like the best seal of approval that you can get, especially for the courts. Because as soon as a court sees that you are officially certified and um, sworn in, then they're like, okay, yeah, that's fine. He, he's a good guy. Um, scientifically <laughs> scientifically right and from that point on we we had like our little Sherlock Holmes office here yeah very cool Tim he was saying that they wanted to hire him at the police station but they couldn't because he had a PhD and he would make more money than the chief of the department oh, the police yeah. department and so it was illegal it's wow. illegal isn't that crazy yeah but I believe it <laughs> <laughs> also Oh, I, I can, I can. Also, there are federal institutes. We have, of course, we have a federal police. It's it's unlike the FBI. It works completely differently. And the federal, um, it's a little bit like um, a federal lab of the FBI. So not a local FBI lab, but a federal lab. And over there, they, um, they were switching everything to DNA. And they told me that um, if I really wanted to continue to do like forensic entomology and so on, that would be not possible because they're switching all the biologists to um, forensic DNA. That And there, there they do employ PhD um, people if they can only PhD people because, they, you know, they, they are cheap for them. Um, it's, 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 you get a high qualification for a low amount of money there. And and you get a job guarantee. So that's why many people who want to have a family uh, take the jobs because you have a job guarantee until the end of the days. And um, but but I wanted to also to work on complicated cases and not only on routine DNA cases or even complicated DNA cases. So that's why at the federal institute that we decided that it wouldn't fit. Yeah. Either. Oh, we have another question. What kind of cases do you work on most often? Um, complicated, complicated cases that either nobody believes in, no, like like the sexual assault case that I mentioned, um, then cases that nobody's interested in. For example, religious wonder, you know, like miracles and stuff, um, which and they are very interesting because you get a, you get a very good idea about how to distinguish between fact and assumption because there are a lot of assumptions on the religious level but the interesting th thing is in most cases they did allow me to work on the cases i did the mummies in palermo it's it's the hugest um, collection of mummies anywhere on planet earth and they were like okay mark knows how to behave in a catholic church and in, in a catholic <laughs> mon monastery um so you know we don't care if he's tattooed and and if if he's not religious and so on and so on but he knows how to behave and um, we became good for or I, not the rest of the team, but I became good friends with the with the monks. And um, it it was it was a good atmosphere. And at the end of the day, we're like, okay, it's interesting what you find found out scientifically, and um, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's because to us to us it's a religious miracle. And I'm like, okay, no problem. Let's have a lemonade. And you know, I like you. You like. <laughs> But but the good thing is I get access to the to the miracles and to me a criminal forensic whatever case is no different to a religious miracle because you have a lot of assumptions you have a lot of emotions you have a lot of uh, chit chat and I'm like I don't you know I'm just looking for the stains as long as I get my stains I'm happy so the, that's then we have a lot of cases for example today we had a case 
in which the social workers, the, 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 the mother thinks that the social workers may take away her kid because the kid is bleeding unusually from the throat and from the eyebrows and uh, from the from the upper lip and it it's profuse and thin and really unusually looking i, I have to say but i'm the one who works on um, blood sweating this comes from the religious miracles by the way and then I, i i wrote an article like two years ago about the topic but i think it's german but i will translate it in english so it's going to be out in english sooner or later and um It looks like blood sweating because that is possible. For example, if you fear for your life and you have a change, a very rapid change in blood pressure, it mostly happens in, in situations of uh, severe nightmares. And then you wake up and then the nightmare is gone very quickly. It's a, it's a particular type of nightmare, not the usual ones, uh, but you can easily measure it by by measuring the blood pressure and the sweating and so on it's very easy to measure that they are not making it up you can even put people in the in the um, imaging machines you know like brain imaging and um so we were working on that case because she was afraid that her kids would be taken away because they think it's a munchausen uh, syndrome you know where, where the where the mother makes the kid sick or gives the kid blood to drink so the the kid vomits blood and so on i don't know we don't know yet but that was the case that started today That's interesting. Another question, go ahead. What cases do you like, or are the most appealing to you or the most like fulfilling that you like to work on? Are like criminal ones or is it more like religious ones or like historical? I don't make a distinction, to be honest, especially when you're saying historical ones. We had a case that was like hundreds of million years old, not kidding. It was, it was um, um, a kind of fish dinosaur you know and um, in the fossils they saw this is published also you you can find it out uh, it's it's uh, sink or bloat exploding whales uh, you know it's it's all on my web page but you can also find it with google no problem and um, the question was is it possible that even when the water is cold and the pressure is high on the bottom of the sea that you can have bloating of a corpse and then it explodes and i'm like i mean no corpse ever explodes. I mean, the only thing that happens is that the intestines are, are getting pushed out by the bacterial gases once you open the corpse, but an, an actual explosion like with TNT or dynamite is just not happening. So they're like, yeah, okay, Mark, you know, don't be too specific. Uh, we just have the problem that in our fossils, we see the ribs uh, like li laying around. And then long story, story made short, um, these were bacterial gases bloating the corpse, but the only thing they did was not explode the um, corpse, but push out the baby fish dinosaur. So it was like, it, it also happened in Europe, like young women who were pregnant were buried. And then after 40 days, this is a religious thing. After 40 days, they were looking if, if they were witches or vampires or something like that. And then there was a kid all of a sudden in the coffin, buried. And um, that was the same thing. The bacterial gases pushed out the kids. And then all of a sudden there was a kid there. And um, that led to a lot of speculation, like the devil had sexual intercourse with a buried young woman or somebody else put their illegal child in the coffin during burial and so on. But it's really just the bacterial gases pushing out the kid vaginally. And um, so, you know, I don't care if it's a new case with with such a grave birth inside of the coffin or if it's like hundreds of million years old and it's a fish dinosaur or something. <laughs> so it's all the same. That's, for me. that's crazy. Really interesting. Really interesting. Other fish questions? Dinosaur. You've had some work doing some uh, serial killer cases. Can you talk about that briefly? Yes. It's again, it's the same thing, you know, just just do it. If you hear about cases and you think nobody is working on it from your perspective or from your angle on, let's say, like, Tim, you're a crime scene investigator or something or have been. And, and you think that nobody checked the crime scenes properly because, for example, due to DNA testing, you know exactly who it was. And, you know, the police did a lot of like research on let's say phone calls and cameras you know cctv and stuff and everybody knows what happens at the end of the day criminalistically but um it could be interesting for you to to get the exact modus operandi of what what did he do when 
to avoid further cases that are not detected. Because, I mean, all of the time we get new serial killer cases, even in the United States, and you're asking yourself, how is that possible? I mean, how could after, let, let's say, if you take the European research on the topic of serial murder, especially, and then, of course, the Americans, US Americans later, um, how is that still possible? I mean, how can you not see that serial killing is going on? How can we still have like 50 or 60 or 100 or in one of my cases, 300 victims? How is that even possible in modern times? And the, in my opinion, professional opinion, I mean, the reason is that very often the cases are thought to be understood, but in reality, they are they. Are, they are so different. For example, Bernardo Homolka case, where I think each of them was not a serial killer, but as a pair, as a couple, they became serial killers. Or old European cases. For example, Curtin, he was a guy who was a guillotine. You know, his head was cut off with, with like a huge knife falling down. And he was interested in his own execution because he wanted to know if his severed head would still hear his own blood rushing out of his body and so on. So there was a lot of fetishism in that case, you know, like blood fetishism and so on. And I think it is interesting to do the crime scene investigation, even if it's not necessary juridically or police wise anymore. And also to talk to the serial killers very calmly, very friendly on 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 like a on the same level because i'm telling them okay you are an expert for your you know killings nobody is alive probably anymore who could tell the story so you're the only one i'm i look at the stains and we can meet in the middle you tell your story and i check if this aligns with the stains if it does not if the stains do not match your story i'm not interested i'm out but if your story matches the stains and your story is different from the story that everybody thinks what happened, except from the killings, but, you know, everything else, for example, childhood experiences or like who did what at a certain point during the abduction, who may have seen something and especially how can we enter prevention Um then I think you could always do it. It's very stressful often. For example, one my the, the probably most famous client, Garavito, um, who is probably going to be released soon after 300 killings in Colombia. Um, um, I think we 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 were just clicking, you know, like because I was under the impression that he had a story to tell, and he, I mean he was abused as a kid, and I don't pity him, you know, for his crimes. But I think it's worth mentioning that he had a lot of stress factors that made his psychopathy much, much worse and enabled the killings. It's not that it's anybody's fault. It's it's exclusively his fault. But I mean, as a child, he had a lot of bad influences that made him become a worse person for sure. And he knows that. And it's interesting to filter that out, out to find out how to prevent further persons becoming serial killers or bad people and at the end of the day many of them would like to lead a normal life and after many 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 not serial killers but also like you know people who performed all types of crimes um the wish for a, a peaceful normal life is and also a stable relationship to a significant other that's also something that pe people tend to forget those two things they they are um, um, at the core of the personality of human beings and of all animals, of course, but also human beings. And um, if you try to strengthen their um, capability to have like a meaningful, strong, loving bond, either to humans or to animals or to whatever, then that would be something or that is something that may prevent crime or help preventing crime. But to do that, you need to talk to them. And it's uh, sometimes really, you know, not very pleasant, especially because especially the psychopathic killers, they describe their crimes very calmly, you know, like, yeah, and then I cut off the scrotum and the penis and then I put it in the head. Oh, I should mention that I cut off the head before, uh, uh, in case you don't know. And then afterwards, I raped uh, the body. But 
you know, I'm not a ne necrophiliac. Don't think I'm necrophiliac. It's just because I knew that I would not get another dead person and the, the body was still warm and so on and so on and so on. You know, they ramble on and on and on. And you're like, mm, okay, interesting. Or they don't have any... <laughs> <laughs> they, they obviously they don't have any empathy so w one of them always gave me his coffee in prison in a cage actually like like in a Hannibal Lecter movie like from the 1990s and I'm like why, why do you give give me your coffee because coffee is very precious in prison very very precious like gold and um and he took my coffee and I pr I thought probably that's a friendly gesture or something. And, and he was like very also psychopathic. He was very friendly and he was like, no, no, I'm just afraid that I'm getting poisoned. And I'm like, <laughs> so that means he doesn't care if I get poisoned, you know, he's, and, and you have to get used to that. It's uh it's something that I think not many people can do that. Like my first translator, he swore and he did it. That was a long time ago. He swore he will never enter Colombia in his whole life. And I'm like, Miguel, that was him. I'm like, Miguel, that is the friendliest country on planet Earth. Seriously, it's it, the people are the kindest. The biodiversity is the highest. The food, food is beautiful. You shouldn't, you shouldn't swear things like that. And he's like, no, never again, because he was traumatized. He was completely traumatized after that. Wow. We have time for maybe one more question. Does anyone else have a question they need to get out? Okay. Or maybe two. Don't worry. I mean, you can ask. <laughs> have you ever like run into like cultural differences throughout your career? Like, have you ever worked with foreigners that just don't understand the culture of Germany and the values and has that ever gotten in the way of your job before? Uh, you know what? You're the first person to ever ask the question. That is super cool, really, because usually there's always the 10, 10 same questions. Um, that is a big problem because Germans have a tendency to be like a super pain in all body parts because they are compulsive obsessive and they want to have everything like in order and the ger done the German way. And um, I didn't know that, but I, when I lived in Manhattan, I lived in the old German town where the Germans had been living, the, the German immigrants at that point. But now I know it. There's even a video. I know that's probably in German. I don't know. But um, I was I was always like, because I grew up in a region where we had a lot of, due, due to in, industrial reasons, we had people from um, a, a Muslim people, from a, a Turkish people. We had Polish people who were super Catholic, like the most Catholic you could even imagine. We have a lot of Protestant people um, because that's a big part of German history. Um, then we had people who just didn't take it serious. So for example, they were religious, but they were sinning all the time. And then they were like, yeah, but we don't take it very serious. Then there were some, even some Jewish people, which is rare in Germany because they were all um, killed uh, during the Second World War, of course. But some people came um, back or you know decided that they wanted to give an example that it's possible to live in Germany and so on and so on so when I went to um, what was the first countries Vietnam there I set up the first uh, forensic DNA lab there Philippines I also set up the first forensic DNA lab in the Philippines then Colombia and United States and uh, Canada and the good thing was I just didn't realize the cultural differences because I always tried to keep my mouth shut when it comes to sports, music, order, law, um, any type of that. Because I'm like, I'm the stain nerd. I just want your blood and your sperm and your hair and your saliva. <laughs> you know, I don't care. I don't care about that. And that saved the day. Because, for example, in uh, Medellin and in all the regions where the cocaine comes from, Flor Florencia, Medellin, Bogota, and so on and so on, I have never seen anybody except me deeply entering the field because they hate the gringos. They, as a person from the United States, you are always the person who sends over the military and, you know, you, who is brutal and, and not, not treating the people in Latin America, right? But I didn't know that. But I just observed it after a few years. And then I was asking, like, 
do you have a grudge against gringos? And they're like, no, we like the people from the United States. No, no. And then after like 15 years, I was like, okay, how come I never see a gringo over, over the year? And they're like, okay, Mark, now we can tell you. We really don't like them. And I'm like, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, why is that? And then they're like, yeah, because, you know, the, the military operations and, and po political things and so on, they just don't work out. And that's the same thing in Vietnam uh, and in the Philippines. For example, in the Philippines, the United States, they had a big base there, you know, um, from Second World War. And everybody was saying, hi, Joe, hi, Joe. That, that came from Second World War because the people thought it was an American greeting, uh, like, hello, and Joe. <laughs> hi Joe, hi Joe. They still do it sometimes, especially in the favelas or in the slums in, in the Philippines. And even there, you would expect much, much more people from the United States and other countries being there. But at, at the end of the day, you have to put everything that is cultural aside. Everything. When we the first when we set up the DNA lab in the Philippines, they still had the rule that a rule that is it's it's happens in several American uh, um, Asian countries that the the oldest person is right no matter what so when I set up the laboratory and um, uh, cases got to the courtroom we just sent the oldest person and the oldest person would just read the statement had no idea what the statement was about the lab statement because it was the oldest person and I never said anything about that I was like okay whatever if that helps then let's send the oldest person. Um, also, um, what, what you would call today like diversity and you know gay pride and stuff like that, that was unknown. Um, in Colombia, allegedly, there were no gay people. They just didn't exist, even though there was a gay bar. In, um, in the United States, in Manhattan, there was in Manhattan, in New York, there was not one single person that came out of the closet in the laboratory. Allegedly, everybody straight, heterosexual, everybody. Um, in uh, you know, it 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 comes from so many sides: political, cultural, diversity, whatever you. And you know, mm -hmm. the good thing was that I never cared about it, and I can only recommend that to you don't ever make any statement. Or even if you can, if you are totally like like a Judaist, like I'm like from, from the movie Big Lebowski, that's very old. I even have the jacket here. <laughs> so then it means, it means, you know, just, just you know, awesome. do, do what you're supposed to do or what you want to do. Do it in a happy, peaceful way. In my case, stains. Okay. But don't ever enter any politics or cultural discussions. You know, final example on that that matter because that's a big thing now. Um, should I work in a country where the cultural and political values are not mine? Yes, because there are people raped, murdered. Uh, you know, and those people they probably need a specialist it doesn't matter if in that country your cultural and political values are not yours i'm not i'm not a politician and i'm not like the person to make the world a better place apart from forensics that's my job that to make the world a better forensic science place but that's it so yeah i i made a lot of experience with that but i was lucky that i didn't know about that before <laughs> before i started to work internationally Mark, we just want to thank you. How do you pronounce your last name? Doesn't matter. That's in, <laughs> your, in the United <laughs> in the United Stop States. Mark. It's Bineki. In the United States, okay. it's Bineki. In China, it's Maliang. In in Germany, it's Bineke. So whatever you want. Okay. Well, thank you so much yeah. for coming today. We really appreciate it. We may have you back. You are so interesting and have done so many cool things. I think everybody here is like, gosh, I wish I lived that life. Um, so thank you so much. We've got a class coming in here in five minutes. So we'll go ahead and end here. But we sure appreciate your time and everything that you have done. If you guys want to just peek on as you walk out so they can see all the students that were here because you didn't get to see you. So thank you.